Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap up for the last week and a half of December of 2017. I have attempted to film this I think five times now, it keeps turning into either a really long rambling thing or else a truck drives down the street and I just have to delete. The best thing that I read at the end of the year was Kai Cheng Tom's A Place Called No Homeland, which is a poetry collection dealing with a variety of topics mostly centered around identity, multi-generational immigrant identity, as well as gender and sexuality and place. A lot of it's centered around Vancouver and Montreal. The way the spaces between words and the use of flashes and indentations was really, really interesting and really made you feel the way this would feel as if it were being performed as a spoken word work. And I think there's a lot of poetry that I think would lend itself to being spoken and performed more so than being read, and it's often hard to read material like that, but in this case the way the the lines are placed on the page is done so well that you definitely have a sense of how they would sound out loud. As it was just done so well. Another something that I read while I was traveling was the first collection of the new Batwoman series. This is Batwoman Volume 1, The Many Arms of Death. This is written by Marguerite Bennett and James Tynan IV. As I often say when it comes to Batwoman, I really like the way that her default style lends itself to very dramatic imagery with the red and the black. As stories go, this did a fairly standard, I would say almost a 1960s style action plot where normally you would see something like this with a James Bond type character but instead it is Batwoman. The writing acknowledges a bit that there's something a little bit neo-colonial about that kind of story but it doesn't really explore that other than mentioning that that's something that's going on which I thought wasn't super satisfying. It was fine as these stories go. It was certainly better than the really ridiculous ending to the last Batwoman series. This book I think gets points Hello dog. <laughs> this book, I will say the one thing that surprised me the most about this book is that it had, this is a teen rated book. If you're not familiar with superhero comics, they have ratings on them very much like movies do. So this is not a mature reader's book. So one expects a certain level of violence and a somewhat lower level of language and sexuality. But there is a scene in here that I haven't seen the equivalent of since really early in Alan Moore's Promethea, which I think came out in the late 90s. So, I mean, we're talking about a good 17 years ago. There was a scene in there that represented a tantric sex scene between this male and female character in a two-page spread that was just a cup and a wand. And even though it was a cup and a wand, you could clearly imagine what that was supposed to represent. And in this book, there is a scene between Batwoman and this other woman on an island because it's that kind of story. And then there's a single page spread that is basically peeling and de-seeding fruit. And it is clearly a sex scene between them. So that surprised me because as I said, it's been 18 years since I've seen a scene like that in a T-rated comic. Anyway, it was okay. Next up, I read No One Can Pronounce By Name by Rakesh Satyal. This is a book that I went into I think I almost misunderstood what style of book this was. This is very much a book club type read where there are several issues that you could discuss and it would be fun to chat about that at a book club, but it doesn't actually go into any of them in any depth. And I was expecting this to be a lot more like Farzana Doctor's Seven Meters of Pavement, which I read a few years ago and I really loved. And it sounded like this was going to have a a character who was basically the gender swapped American version of the main character in that because that book was about a middle-aged Indian Canadian man who was sort of going through his midlife crisis and go who's part of a writer's workshop and has a much younger friend who he's supporting because she came out as a lesbian to her parents and her parents don't accept that and, he, and this book is about an Indian American woman who is in a writer's workshop and early on in the book has a much younger male friend who she is similarly supporting because his family doesn't accept that he had come out. So I was expecting something similar and that was perhaps not accurate because Seven Meters of Pavement is a lot deeper than this is. 
This definitely deals with a lot of similar issues in terms of elements of identity and the immigrant experience and midlife crises, but all at a very superficial level, which is fine I, because I don't think this is meant to get particularly deep. And for a book club read, I think this would be great. You can imagine the reading group guide for this, but it just was not what I expected. I also thought uh, two of the three main characters in this are characters in their early 40s, and they all read like they're 70 years old. And I don't think that that's necessarily intentional, because there is actually a conversation between the female character and her husband fairly late in the book where they're there's actually a joke that they're conversing like people in their 60s would converse. The implication of that being that they're not always talking like characters in their 60s, but they really do. So there are mainly three point of view characters in this, but there's one chapter that is by an additional person and it doesn't really fit. Also, of the three characters, one of them probably didn't actually need to be in there, and I think the book would have been stronger for that. It wasn't what I was expecting, so I have a hard time properly talking about it, because I was reading it thinking it was meant to do something different than what it was meant to be doing. But it's no seven meters of pavement. <laughs> Which I don't think was not necessarily successful in everything that it did, but it was definitely a more interesting look at a lot of similar topics. And next up I read Hisham Matar's The Return. The subheading on this one is Fathers, Sons, and the Land in Between. Hisham Matar is originally from Libya, or technically he was born in the United States because his father was a diplomat at the UN when he was born, but they went back to Libya when he was quite young. His family went into exile in Egypt when he was eight years old, and he eventually went to school in the UK. And his father was a political dissident who in the early 90s was captured and imprisoned and they generally believe that he was probably executed in the mid-90s, but there has never been any paperwork towards that. This is the story of his being eventually being able to return to Libya and trying to find out what happened to his father. It's part memoir and part exploration of recent Libyan history, and, and also a meditation on what it means to be in exile. I was actually expecting this to be more descriptive of place, because his in the country of men, which is about a child growing up in Libya, who eventually goes into exile in Egypt, and was just the most beautifully descriptive thing in terms of the way the narrative described places and temperatures. So I was expecting this to be similar, and it's not. This is much more about descriptions of emotions and feelings. So that surprised me a bit, but it was definitely very interesting to read. After that, I read The Long Road Home, a Story of War and Family by Martha Raddatz. I believe there's been a miniseries that depicts some of this. It is about a US military operation that happened in the early 2000s in Iraq that went wrong and basically resulted in few American deaths, a number of American injuries, and more than 500 Iraqi deaths. So it was a major encounter that happened over 48 hours, where there are a number of things happening where you, where you do think that will go poorly. So because it's over such a short period of time, it's uh, hard not to draw a comparison to Black Hawk Down. This is not as compelling as Black Hawk Down. This, I don't think, does quite as good a job of separating out the different people who were involved. There is a point at the end where they show you photos of all of the people who died, and there was one where I genuinely had no idea who that was, and I had to go back and it they were actually hardly mentioned. So it wasn't completely successful that way. It strips away any kind of mention of politics, but what happens with that is you don't get a lot of context. And I feel like even though there wasn't, in terms of page count, I don't think there was a lot of context in Black Hawk Down, but I feel like what you did get there was more informative than what was happening here. Like in this, we know that there is a particular organization in this neighborhood that has taken over the police stations, but there isn't much beyond that. And that's the kind of thing that, yes, you can go and look up elsewhere, but there are no references to it in the back of this. The whole reference section is basically a list of names, which the implication is, okay, she interviewed the main players in this, but in terms of context, I, I was left wanting. It was still quite compelling. It didn't take long to read. It was interesting. I wanted to find out more, but it was no Black Hawk Down. After that, I read How Music Got Free by Stephen Witt. 
The subheading on this one is The End of an Industry, The Turn of the Century, and The Patient Zero of Piracy. This is a look at basically mp3s and file sharing and what that did to the music industry between basically the mid 90s to the mid 2000s. This focuses mainly on one of the inventors of the mp3, one record executive and one guy who worked at a cd pressing factory who was stealing cds and leaking them all early. All three of those stories were very interesting and I enjoyed reading all of this. I really liked the ref in the reference section there would sometimes be extra bits of the quotes in that, so I really appreciated that. The one complaint that I have about this is, seems very minor, because it's the introduction and then the final chapter, where the author frames his own attitude and describes it in a very generational way. He does that in a way that I kind of didn't buy, just because he makes a comment about how he hasn't paid for music since the late 90s on the first page, and then on the final page he admits that he has a Spotify account now and that that's just a generational thing, and that the generational cutoff is just a couple of years older than him. And I don't believe that. <laughs> I'm a couple of years older than the author is, and my sister is a couple of years younger, so I feel like we're of that generation. And I feel like I know quite a few people who are a bit older than I am, who probably have a story similar to his, and I know a few people who are younger than my sister, who have had significantly more moral discussions about file sharing, and specifically about music, and I think that distinction is less generational and more about whether the people are focused on technology versus artistry. Like I know an ongoing discussion that a lot of my sister's friends had were around something that they called the Jane Bennett rule, and Jane Bennett is a jazz clarinetist, and it was basically if somebody is less famous than Jane Bennett and you're stealing their music, that's terrible. You need to go and buy something from them. Now, I mean, obviously these are individual cases, but I definitely think there is a cultural attitude around what was going on between, let's say, the mid-90s and the mid-2000s before it became easy to legally obtain music in bits and pieces that is a lot more complicated than his kind of glib notes at the beginning and the end. Now, I mean, this book is not about the culture. This book is about these very specific three uh, personal case studies. And that part was great, but the, that beginning and end so distracted me and so irritated me that it took away from my appreciation of the rest of the book. I feel like this was a case where there was one paragraph at the beginning of this book and one paragraph at the end of the book that basically ruined the rest of it for, for me, even though I thought that this was well-researched and interesting. I feel like there's probably another story to be told or book to be written or research to be done about those kind of cultural attitudes or subcultural attitudes if you want. Yeah, and this isn't that. So I can't fairly hold against him that that's not what he dug into in the book, but again I don't think he should have introduced it in that distracting way right on the first page. In terms of content, interesting, but I was so distracted that I couldn't appreciate the interesting bits. So that was how 2017 ended for me. It was a lot of books where I was comparing them to other things, really. That wasn't Black Hawk Down, and Batwoman wasn't Promethea, and No One Can Pronounce My Name wasn't Seven Meters of Pavement. <laughs> I liked the poetry, though. Anyway, I hope you had a great new year, and yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.